We're about to open up our text into John chapter 16. And as we continue on this, it's going to be pretty uh, fun to work through these things. And we've been working through the book of John in this series called The Gospel of Jesus. And so if you're new with us today, you're coming in on chapter 16 of the gospel of Jesus. And for context, Jesus is with his disciples. Uh, We have 11 disciples left because Judas has just left the uh, uh, brigade of disciples to go and betray Jesus. We just had the Last Supper. So if you've seen the famous painting of the Last Supper, we just experienced all that back in John 13, 14, 15. And now we come to John 16, after he has said many things and washed their feet, and he's getting ready in the last 24 hours of his life to go to the cross. I love certain public settings. Who's ever been to a giant football game? You love it, okay? So fun. Many of you have been downtown uh, Columbia for one of the big uh, football games. It's awesome. It's loud and it's amazing and it's so fun. And I love hearing people's stories about what the energy was and how it was at the game. Uh, I went to the national championship game um, when it came to Santa Clarita, California, because I'm an Alabama fan and Alabama was playing the uh, very terrible team named Clemson. And. Yeah, rule number one, don't offend half the audience before we we get into the message. Oh, well. And uh, it doesn't matter, you won the game, so I mean, joke's on me, right? Uh, so, So it was this big public moment of like cheering and shouting and all this. And it was so fun. There was this energy and, and enthusiasm about it. And I remember being like a raving fan of that. Public moments, huge, awesome moments. They're great. But when I talk to people off to the side and I tell me, and I say, tell me one of the most like pivotal moments of your life, I've noticed something. They don't typically talk about the public moments they've experienced. However, they do usually bring up a private, personal moment in a conversation with one other person because personal moments have a difference that public moments just don't have. And when you think about the personal moments and the personal conversations and the phone calls and the coffee shop visits and the car rides and the conversations of words you'll never forget, those are these personal life-changing moments that may have altered the trajectory of your life, and had it not been for that, there wouldn't be other public moments that you experience because you may not have even wound up in those places of publicity with people. Why? Because personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. That's the setting of the text. That personal moments with Jesus have a certain power that public moments just don't have. You will never remember every single worship song this church plays Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. No matter how hard we practice, no matter how much we prepare, no matter how good the worship music sounds, no matter what. But let me tell you something. There's some people that just got prayer a moment ago, and they'll never forget the personal moment they just have. Why? Because... Personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. you got to get that in your spirit if you're taking notes. That personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. It's why last week we said you don't have a sin issue, you have a devotion issue. And the more devoted we become in the private personal moments with Jesus, the more power we have to conquer over things that seem to be weighing us down. And enter in John chapter 16 as Jesus is relaxing, reclining, and chilling with the 11 last disciples. And he says, John 16, verse 5 through 15. 
But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus is saying, I am leaving, I'm going away. And instantly, he says, none of you even ask, where are you going? Instead, he's seen the look in their eyes, and the text tells us that they are filled with grief because he had said these things. Filled with grief. Now, you got to get into this context. These are... Are, are, are these 11 people who have walked with Jesus and they have followed him for three and a half years and they have given up everything for this moment. And in this, all of a sudden, they, they can't predict the future any more than you or I can. All of a sudden, Jesus just lets them know, in a little while, I'm going to go away. I'm leaving. I'm making my grand exit. I I won't be with you any longer. And they're thinking to themselves like, what? You're you're, you're leaving now? Like, we gave up all of this. And, and, And when the text says that they're filled with grief, this is the heightened point of anxiety inside of their soul because they are experiencing loss And they know that in this relationship, they're processing it logically going, we're losing our leader. We're losing our friend. He's telling us that he's leaving. We don't even have words to say, where are you going? We just know you're not going to be with us. So no matter where you're going, we're just going, you're not with with us. And, and, And that feels painful. And we're losing something. And it says they are filled with grief. And that's what it feels like when any of us lose something. When any of us have a transition and experience loss, loss is a reality. Loss will get anybody. When you are transitioning from one season to the next season, there is a loss that you experience from this season to the next season. And they are experiencing loss, and the byproduct is grief. And in that, Jesus pauses and he said, but this is a good thing. Because I'm going to send another. I'm going to send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost to indwell in you, and he'll be with you forever. So I'm leaving but I'm coming back, but I'm going to look different, but I'm leaving, but, but I'll be with you, and it's going to be, you're just going to have to wait for it to all make sense in a moment. But the good news is, is that he is the advocate, the spirit of truth that I'm going to send to you so that you can have me in you and living through you and speaking to you all the time. He reintroduces what he talked about in John 14 with the Holy Spirit coming. And he says, I am going to send him to you. It is for your good that I leave so that he might come so that he can do for everyone what I was doing for a few physically because now it will be the same spirit that resurrected Christ from the grave that will live in anyone 
whosoever calls on His name. And so he says, I'm leaving, remain in me, and you're going to experience loss. And even when you do, I've already prearranged it that I'm going to give you the advocate. And the word advocate means guide, teacher, counselor, comforter. So here's what he says. First thing you got to do, Inside of this, like the disciples, point one is you got to mourn your losses. Okay, loss is inevitable. Mourning is optional. Grief is what happens when you experience loss. But some of us haven't mourned our losses, and we can get stuck in stages of grief. Okay, so there are certain places of grief that he knew that these, are, these disciples are going to get stuck in. You are filled with grief, but I'm sending the advocate. You know what's amazing about this is that he says in a few verses later, John 16, 20 through 21, he relates this thing they're going through and the trouble that they're, they're about to experience to a woman giving birth, and he uses the word mourn. He says in verse 20, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Like a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. That's the words of Jesus relating to this. And he says, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to dwell in you and to be with you. And inside of that, he is going to counsel you through grief. That's what he does. He counsels us through grief. So I need you to mourn your losses. And anytime we experience pain, there's two responses to it. To either avoid it altogether, which is avoid it and pretend like it never happened and pretend like it doesn't exist, or to ignore it and to at some times think about it a little bit and then stuff it back down, and then think about it a little bit and then stuff it back down, and then think about it some more and then be like, no, no, no I'm not going there. And when we do this, we don't actually mourn our losses. And he is saying that the Holy Spirit is the wonderful counselor. It was prophesied back in the Old Testament that he is our wonderful counselor and that he is the everlasting God and that he is going to counsel us through things. And what a counselor does is they dig out certain parts of our soul that have us stuck in places that God always meant to set us free from. But it is our choice to mourn all the losses we experience. And when you don't do it, you get stuck in a stage that God has the power to see you through. Listen to me. When you don't mourn, you get stuck in a stage that God has the power to see you through. It's funny about the word grief is we've picked up on it in psychology and counseling and all this for so long. Counseling. Counseling, parakletos is what this word is, the Holy Spirit. He is our counselor. Well, counselors said that there's five stages of grief, that there is denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's depression, and then there's acceptance. Some of us have not mourned our losses and we're wondering why we are still angry at certain people of the past. Maybe, just maybe, it's because you're stuck in a stage that God wanted to see you through. And the only way to really get through this is to mourn your losses. I was right there. I went to a monastery last year in January of 2023, and I was processing a, a certain friendship that I had lost. And, you know, pain will get everybody, by the way. Like, it's no respecter of people, right? 
And so I was wanting to process this thing, and I got to meet with um, one of the monks at the monastery. His name's Father Garrick, but I thought it'd be a lot cooler to call him Father G. And uh, I thought it was a little ir- irreverent to try it first because, you know, it's the, the, the monk, right? And so I just said, can I just, you know, like, call you Father G, you know? <laughs> and I, I thought, like, I might get slapped up the head, you know, but he just looked at me, and he was like, ha, Father G. I like that. And I said, hey, I said it first. Okay, all right. It's all me, baby, all me. And so I sit with him in this moment, and I'm, I, and I'm just bearing my soul, and I'm, and I, and I'm talking to him, and, and, and I'm telling him this story of what happened and where I'm at with it. And I said, I don't know how to get past this, and I seem to, you know, just just try to, you know, move further away from it. And every time I think about it, I either avoid it or I ignore it. And I just don't want anything to do with it. And he looks at me and he says, maybe as simple as it sounds is you haven't let this broken relationship break your heart. Maybe you haven't grieved the relationship yet. And he said, and sometimes the only way to let go of it is to go through it and allow the emotions of a friend to come. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget this phrase. He said, the way out of it is to go further into it. I was stuck in anger for two years because I wasn't willing to go through it. The, listen to me. Some of y'all are stuck. This is, for, I mean, this is specific today, and I know it's like, wow, it's kind of heavy and all that. I'm just in John 16, y'all. That's what Jesus said. I'm just here to tell the story, okay? But some of us need to mourn our losses, and I'm telling you the only way out of it is to lean further into it. You want to know why? Because personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. And I think that's what Jesus was getting at, that a counselor's very personal. That mourning your losses is very personal. That going through the process and the stages of letting the emotions come and grieving it And mourning it is very personal. And you don't usually find those type of things in big old public settings. We come to church. God is good all the time. All the time. Oh, yeah. And under the surface, we're like, I ain't going there. Uh -uh. No, Jack. Public moments are fine with me, Pastor. I just uh, personal stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, chapter 15 was all just remain in me, stay connected to me, be devoted to me. And when you're devoted to me, there are certain things the counselor goes, hey, I want to press into this because I believe there is freedom for your soul. And if we don't press into this, then you will grow up and you will mature the exact emotion that you're stuck in. And what was once just slight irritation can grow to frustration and can grow to full-blown anger. And I didn't didn't intend to leave you that way, but it's your choice if you go further into it. Can you go further into it this week with the Holy Spirit? Because he counsels you that that's his job, according to Jesus. He says, I'm going, and they're full of grief. They experienced the loss of a friend. He goes, that's okay, I'm going to counsel you through that in a minute. We'll get there. We'll get there, and your joy will be made complete. That the world will rejoice while you mourn, but there will be joy that will make you complete. Some of us are not experiencing joy and peace because we are stagnant in a place where we have not mourned the losses. And it's time for you to mourn the losses. Then he says, 
When he comes, he will prove the world to be in wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people don't believe in me. Point two, relate to him daily. Relate to him daily. You got to relate to the Holy Spirit daily. It's not just in these rooms and in these places where you experience God. You can get this every day of the week if you relate to him daily. You don't have to wait till Sunday service. You you can get motivational worship on Monday in your car going to work. You can get transformational worship on Tuesday as you are in your house. You can get wild worship on Wednesday. You can get true worship on Thursday. You can get your free worship on Friday. You can get your your, your, your sanctified worship on Saturday. And then when you come into the house of the Lord on Sunday, you can simply spew because you've been worshiping him and relating to him all week long. And that's the point of coming together because why? Personal moments have power that Public moments just don't have. But I want you to see what he says that the Holy Spirit's role is. Holy Spirit's role as the advocate is to counsel us, which we've already talked about, to help mourn and grieve and be there for the comfort that he is to provide. But then it says that he'll talk to the world and in it he will he will. Prove the world to be in wrong about sin. Now, he doesn't say sins. This is a singular word about sin because people do not believe in me. That the original, according to what I'm reading in verse 9, the original sin that God wants to deal with with every single person is believing in him. He says that about sin, people don't believe in me. And so what does the Holy Spirit do? He comes to convict us of sin. And when we relate to him daily, he is convicting us more and more in a very good way towards being more like Christ. When we remain in him, and he prunes everything that ought not belong, then we let the word of God cut us. Let it cut. Let it take certain things off. Let it prune down the bush. Let it, let it come unto our attitudes and our characteristics and the sin that ought not be there. And listen to me, we'll be like, well, why would he convict? That sounds so heavy, you know? We ought not experience the emotion of guilt unless you're the one who's guilty. then it's just a fact. And the advocate is a legal term that he's using that the advocate will term to legally represent you towards heaven. And in a legal setting, there is somebody in the room who is guilty. And in that guilt, there must be a sentence reached. And the wages of sin are death. And death, not just for this life, but for life forever, that that's the wages of sin. But somebody has to advocate legally and say, though you feel that way, there is somebody who has already paid the ultimate price about sin and righteousness. Righteousness, he covers you up, that's Jesus, so that when God sees you, he sees the covering of Jesus, and he says, the conviction you feel is to make you more like me, but in the sentence, the guilty party is made clean and whole because Because I only see Jesus when I look at you for those who are followers of the way. But this is a good thing. Because if if you felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit before, that very sensation propelled you into a relationship with Jesus. I was six years old and we attended... Mount Tabor United Methodist Church, rural church in Westover, Alabama. And 
while we were, were there, there was one Sunday, suit and tie church, wooden pews, hymn books, church. Anybody remember church like this? Okay. <clears throat> and um, at the end of the service, the pastor, he said, um, maybe there's somebody in here who's supposed to give their heart to Jesus today. And if that's you, I just want you to come and meet me at the, uh, the front of the room, and I'd love to pray with you. And um, old girl got up there on the pananer and started doing her thing and singing and all this and all that. And I'm telling you, it wasn't cool. Like, there was nothing cool about it. There's nothing, like, awesome about church in this way. Mom, we just had a drug problem. She just drugged me to church, you know, every Sunday once we found this one. And so we're sitting there, and all I can tell you, I don't remember what he said. I don't remember the, the songs we sang. I don't remember three points, five pillars, and seven ways on how to worship God. What I do remember is the advocate showed up. And when the advocate showed up, he convicted a six-year-old boy who had no theological training in seminary and Bible school. And all of a sudden, I felt my heart start to pitter-patter, best I could explain it as a six-year-old. And I felt this thing of like, he's talking to me. That the sin I feel is like, I got to get out of this. And I didn't even really know what all that meant. I just knew God is drawing me in and his spirit is at work on my soul. And without anyone saying, would you like to go up there? No one's moving around. And me at six years old, it was like somebody had strings on my feet. And it was like, all of a sudden I just was a marionette puppet and I got up and I started walking to the front of this altar, little six-year-old kid. And I met Brother Johnny down at the front. And I said, that thing you're talking about, I don't even really know. I just know I want it. And he said, that's the conviction of sin. That's the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, I want him. And I want to be whatever this is, Jesus follower. And he said, let's pray. And so we started to pray. We prayed right there at that altar, and I invited Jesus into my heart. Now, I wasn't perfect the rest of my life by no means at all. I just know that that was the day that I felt the conviction of what that was, and I began believing in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'll never forget it. You want to know why? Because personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. And I know that you won't remember every sermon I preach. But you also don't remember every meal that you ever eaten. All you knew was the meal that you ate provided the sustenance you needed to get you through to the next meal. And that's what church is often like. I just know I'm providing enough sustenance to get you through to the next meal. But feeding yourself is your job. So you got to relate to him daily. And for some of us, he convicts us of that, and that's a good thing. We have to have that. Culture can't tell us how to live our lives. The Holy Spirit must. And when you start believing in him, he starts changing your desires and your wants. You've got to relate to him daily because he convicts us of sin and makes you more like him. But on this, some of us have a, have a way of kind of forgetting all that Jesus has done in our life. And the disciples are sitting in this place. You know, Jesus is about to go to the cross within hours of this point. And so fast forward to the end of John 16. And after he gives this whole idea on Holy Spirit coming and he's going to be with you and he's going to comfort you and he's going to counsel you and he's going to guide you into all truth and convict the world of sin and all this, which sounds pretty like, I don't really know how to grasp it when you're thinking of it from their perspective. In John 16, 29, the disciples speak up. Now listen to what they say. They said, then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Now verse 31 says, 
Jesus goes, do you now believe? Jesus replied, now? (laughs) Now, now we believe, now we know that you're speaking plainly with no figures of speech. This makes us know that you actually came from God. And Jesus is like, now? Like, do you now believe? Are you joking? Like, if I'm, if I'm Jesus, you know, this is the Alan's spiritual imagination. I'd rewrite the verse like this, John 16, 31. It'd say, you know, you didn't believe then, Jesus retorted. Do you now believe? Like, we're just sitting here in the upper room. We just did communion. We just, we just did a little foot washing, and, and Judas betrayed me. And I said, hey, I'm leaving all y'all. And in a moment, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And they're like, ah, now we know it. Now we believe that you came from God. <laughs> now? I'm going, well, what about then? I mean, like, you didn't know I was from God at the first supper, the feeding of the 5,000? When, when, when little boy came over with two fish and five loaves, and two fish and five loaves doesn't equal 5,000 men plus women and children, 15,000 people potentially, you didn't believe then? You didn't believe in John 2 when I, I, I said, hey, 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 this is, we're at the wedding and, and we ran out of we ran out of, out of wine and, and so that it's your problem because the disciples all came and you know spiritual imagination they drank it all up you know they were heathens before they got saved so they come to Jesus and you didn't believe it then I didn't say go get grapes and squish them and have time and all this to ferment I said go grab water and I turned it to you didn't believe then you didn't believe at the pool of Bethesda when all those lame people were walking around, laying down, and all the people who were sick. And I looked at that one man who had been invalid for 38 years. All that publicness of people. And I said, hey, get up, walk, take up your mat. You didn't believe then? You didn't believe at the second supper when I fed 4,000 people? All those people were around. You know what's funny about every story I just mentioned? You know what they all have in common, don't you? They were all public. Being in the 5,000. 5,000. Water turned to wine. Wedding. 4,000 people. The feeding of the 4,000. Pool Bethesda. So many you can't even count. Public. And now there's 11 people in the room. And they say, no one's in the room with us. It's the upper room. It's closed. It's just a personal moment. Now we believe. Now we've experienced. Now we get it. You want to know why? Because personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. Boy, you ought to be inspired to get with God this week because the disciples themselves are preaching this message based on the text. You didn't believe then? No, 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 we believe now. Now that we've had this personal, private encounter with God. It says, next verse, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered. Each to your own home, you will leave me all alone, yet I'm not alone for my Father is with me. Scattered, this is the life change. You're going to be scattered. You're going to go out there. You're going to be distributors of my presence. You're going to be scattered around the world. And now you're getting ready. You didn't know then? Well, you, knew, you will know when 
the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I'm prophesying him now, Jesus says, but you'll, you'll know when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll get the power of God and you'll be scattered. Why? Because you're going to get to the upper room and you know what you're going to have? You're going to have another personal moment with me. And you'll know when it's time because the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you'll be clothed with power from on high. And when you get the power of that personal moment, you won't have to work it up to evangelize the, the lost. You won't have to work it up to try and talk about Jesus. You won't have to work it up to preach the gospel. When you get that personal moment with the Holy Spirit, the public stuff will be automatic. I close with this. If you'll stand, I don't have time to get to the rest of the content, so I'm going to shut her down. You got to have private moments with Jesus because private moments with Jesus are private moments with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit hears from Jesus everything that he wants to say to you. And he comes to guide you, and he comes to comfort you, and he comes to, to cleanse you, he comes to convict, he comes, he comes to, 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 to bring you into these spaces and places of freedom on your soul. And when we get like that and we're the disciples, a time is coming when you will be scattered. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I want you to get the language there. In me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. Not some people will have trouble. Not you might have trouble. In the world, you will have trouble. And when we stay stuck in that spot and focused on the world and we have all of the trouble, he already told us that, if you remain in me, you'll have peace. So anytime we're experiencing an abundance of trouble that we can't get out of, the question is, are we remaining in him so that we have peace? Are there enough personal moments to balance out the trouble that the world is bringing on us? He says, take heart, I've overcome the world. I'm overcoming them, and I'm going to give my spirit to you. When we get like this, we're scattered to, to have these moments and then to continually distribute them. Listen to me, we're not manufacturers. We're not, I didn't make all this up. I'm just a delivery boy. I, we don't manufacture anything. We're not in the manufacturing business. We're in the distributing business. And as you have personal moments with Jesus, he drops something in your heart and then he scatters us all over Lexington County in the Midlands and he put a deposit in you so that you can distribute it. Now, how you see your life changes what you distribute. There's a man who visited a construction site and there was a group of stonemasons. And this group of stonemasons were all working on stone and they were doing the exact same task. And he walked up to one man and he said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm chipping stone. Okay. Next guy looked at him doing the same task as the first guy. He said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, well, I'm uh, working on this wall. So said, okay. He looked at the third man and he said, what are you doing? And he looked back at him and he said, oh, I'm building a cathedral. How you see the world around you 
after you've spent time with Jesus, it will change. And some of you think that you're just chipping away at stone and God says, no, 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 no. We are building God's kingdom and everywhere you go, I'm using you as a mason to build the kingdom of God. You're building a cathedral in that workplace. You're, you're building a cathedral in that marriage. You're, you're building a cathedral in that family. And as you build it, you are a distributor of God's presence but you cannot give what you have not received. And so you first just have to receive from the Lord and say, okay, I need a personal moment with you before I go public, why? Because personal moments have power that public moments just don't have. Every head bowed, eye closed, let me pray for you. If you're here in this room and you wanna give your heart to Jesus today, This is a personal moment for you in this auditorium right there at your seat. If you were to die right now, you have no idea if you would go to heaven. You don't know if you're in right relationship with Jesus. Like me, you're you're sitting in this church and you're going, well, I don't know why, but the conviction of sin, the pitter-patter of my heart is beginning. I want to know him. 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 I can't explain it. I just want to know him. I want to be close to him. God ordained this moment for you to come into right right relationship with him. If that's you, I wanna know who I'm praying for, a prayer of salvation and repentance, that we are all destined for a place without God unless we of our free will give ourselves unto him, that Jesus came and died as the perfect sacrifice for our sin. And when we come into right relationship with him, he gives us an eternal home in heaven. If that's you, you want to get your heart right with Jesus today because it's time for you to say yes to him. I want you to shoot your hand up on the count of three. One, you know who you are. Two, just you and me. Three, if that's you, would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, keep your hand up for me. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray this prayer of salvation and repentance as one big family right here. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Remove my sin. Cover me with righteousness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and tell me what to do, Lord. I give my life to you. I am a follower of Jesus. I have decided to follow you. No turning back. God, I receive your grace and I'm following you now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we said amen. Amen. Thanks for watching. Head over to vividchurch.com so that you can stay updated with all things Vivid Church. Join us in person or online for one of the services so that you can be a part of our Vivid Church family. But don't stop there. Please share this video so that we can help other people live the vivid story that God has for them. Thank you.